Uh, but Motivated was founded on the belief that for 10 money I spent analyzing aerospace equipment for Boeing and Hercules Aerospace, uh, Motivated could provide 90% of that value. So Pareto principle on steroids, effectively. The reason for this is that the broad sword of MathCAD is so efficient at capturing knowledge uh, required to address an issue that the time-consuming and expensive simulation scalpels like FEA and CFD aren't needed very often. And when those scalpels are required, they are used with intense focus at Motivated. I've trained many of the analysts in New Zealand, and if you check our YouTube channel for my guest lectures at Canterbury University and our institute, you'll see why. I say that because we have lots of other methods we use to minimize the need first, and then we'll make quick, small incisions that make all the difference in your decision making. But this has been Motivated's way for more than 20 years. What's new in Motivated, and in Motivated 3.0 specifically, is encapsulated in this presentation. Leon Daly, uh, Daniel Paris, and Motivated's senior team have gone on a journey looking for and incorporating the best of lean and agile to create a simulation technology that is unique in the world. We're so confident it's unique, we've trademarked it, and we call it Better Buy Analysis. We often come to these seminars and people wax on about how great simulation is as a return on investment. From this study, um, companies achieve 300% return on investment from simulation-driven uh, product development. Uh, from another study, 270 top companies found that all best-in-class manufacturers, or a, a study of 227 top companies, the study found that all the best-in-class manufacturers use simulation in the design phase. So the benefits are well-documented and well-expounded. However, most firms find it actually really a challenge. It can be really difficult to get the value out of simulation if you use it with the classical approach. So why is analysis so hard? In an environment of rapid iteration and trial and error, where does simulation fit in? How do you develop a culture where people can take risks and get the most out of their simulation tools? Well, let's look at some human factors. I'll pick on analysts for a minute because in a previous life I was one and am again when I need to be, like now. Analysts can be very detail-oriented, which is great as we want them to sweat the small stuff. However, sometimes an analyst can get lost in the weeds and lose focus on the wider business objectives. Analysts want to be sure. And the more, an analyst, uh, the more analysis work they undertake, the more certain they believe they are. Never try to satisfy the curiosity of an analyst. Leon just used to hammer that in our engineers. So this leads to us, um, you know, trying to satisfy your curiosity leads to scope creep and estimate spiraling out of control in the quest of accuracy. Analysts don't like to be wrong and can be over, overly conservative. This is particularly true where there's poor psychological safety in the team and the analyst is afraid of being thrown under the bus if their results prove to be inadequate. Analysts can have a rigid view on the appropriate scope of work and of quality. We often see this with analysts from overseas who try to pitch analysis projects at 10 times more than clients are expecting to pay. A take-it-or-leave-it mentality misses the huge value that even a few hundred dollars worth of um, analysis can provide to the decision-making process. 95% of managers will admit they begin design before they know all of the requirements. In fact, the average product developer begins design when 50% of the requirements are known. The implication of this lack of clarity around requirements is twofold. Early decisions have the greatest impact and the effect on products costs, yet they are decisions that are made with the least information. And when knowledge is acquired, the ability to influence cost and make change is really limited because we're too far down the development path. So what to analyze? Well, Gall's law states that all complex systems that work evolved from simpler systems that worked. If you want a, to build a complex system that works, build a simple system first and then improve it over time. I've seen this a lot when someone's trying to develop quite complex systems, which almost always turns to custard. It's much better to try and develop simple subsystems via axiomatic, axiomatic design and then combine them in a more complex systems and then test the interface. 
How then to build knowledge? So one way to build knowledge around design space is to build design knowledge around the design space rather than a single design. A single design is indicated on the single dot in this graph. Or we can analyze several designs. As we can see from this response surface, we may then be able to create more understanding around how systems interact and react with their environment. Examples of this include dimensionless groups in CFD, fan laws, trade-off curves, load models, knowledge templates, such as those that Motivated has developed over the last 20 years that can be reused, e.g. our MathCAD templates. So how to analyze? Try to build knowledge around a design space. Increase the accuracy of your analyses incrementally in successive rounds of analysis. Don't NASA it, MVS it. So minimum viable solution is a technology that Motivated has developed and trademarked to document and expand our knowledge quickly and inexpensively. So the above image shows an agile design development using minimum viable product to obtain and capture knowledge quickly. Daniel and Carlos described this in detail in their product validation presentation yesterday and gave you a real world example of their building a better mousetrap uh, with zip zero invasive predators. So minimum viable simulation is a similar technique, unique in my experience to motivated, that we use to document, expand, and make our knowledge visible to the whole organization. So what to analyze? Failure mode and effects analysis is useful for prioritization, as is things like cost of delay. Note, however, that there, are, there is more to consider than just risk when it comes to prioritization. Some complex items are sometimes best suited to physical testing. Data, availability, and analysis capability are also important factors in that consideration. Another approach, approach gaining popularity is the cost of delay. What component or system incurs the biggest expense if delayed? A note on physical testing, and especially simulations. All simulations are wrong. However, some are close enough to be useful. Whereas simulation provides a theory and deep understanding of your product systems, physical testing provides the reality, albeit with an underlying theory with, without the underlying theory of what's actually happening. So it's great to physically test, but you don't know how close to the margin edge you are. You may just make it and not recognize you're right on the cliff edge. What simulation provides is a knowledge of where all the edges are of our cliffs and pulls us back from those edges so we don't fall off. So who to analyze? A favorite topic among analysis is whether simulation tools like FEA should be used by non-experts, e.g. your average design engineer. There is a secret to tra training designers to use technologies like FEA and CFD and teach them to check, and it's basically to teach them to check their results. A note on using external designers like motivated design and analysis. The goal you should have as a, as a firm is to develop the internal skills and knowledge to whatever level that you feel comfortable using. Uh, so it makes sense to use, but it does make sense to use external resources sometimes. If the workload is lumpy, using external resources to smooth out peak demands or troughs makes a lot of sense financially. Another case is where the required simulations are just too complex for internal staff. Um, as an analyst for Boeing, I was significantly trained. And as, a, um, as a, someone that came to New Zealand as an analyst, I was really shocked at how people thought they were analysts that had just done a little bit of analysis. They really don't know all of the implications of what it is they're doing, especially around the tools they're using. They don't understand the fundamental math and physics that's being replicated in the FEA and CFD codes, and they don't know where those limitations lie. So it's very dangerous to have a designer using analysis without supervision. And without him understanding, there are limits to what he can do with that tool. So using external people like us to do creep analysis, to do nonlinear analysis, do impact analysis, makes a lot of sense because your designers are never going to be trained to the point where they understand all the math and physics that's replicated by those tools. It's just simply the truth, they won't. It's good to use people like Motivated often, but one of the things I would stress and what one of the things Motivated provides is the ability to upskill your team. So what I'm really keen on is getting you guys to be able to do analysis at whatever level you feel comfortable with and whatever level actually works for your organization. So we'll help you develop templates, develop systems and guidelines that help your team use FEA, CFD effectively and safely in your organization. So some other key points, Moore's Laws. Gordon Moore, uh, after which Moore's Law was named, 
observed the exponential increase in computer performance versus time back in the 60s. In essence, the performance of computers has roughly doubled, doubled every 18 months. However, a lot of analysis methods are stuck in the 80s, back when computers were tens of millions of times slower. We did those calculations to figure it out. So example, to analyze a complex plastic component using FEA, analysts would traditionally have spent between a few hours and a few days to clean up the geometry. This makes the model less accurate, but a lot faster. A few decades ago, five hours spent cleaning up a model could reduce the time taken to solve the model by days. However, we regularly see analysts still spending days of work on these tasks to save minutes of time in the run. Sometimes significant pre-processing methods are still required, e.g. for sheet metal structures, where we're going to use shell elements and surface models. But uh, so without the, some upfront work, we can't do those analyses effectively even today with the machines we have today. So another thing that we do often to motivate is to limit our batch size. So the smaller the batch size, the more rapid and the more, the more rapid the feedback and the lower the coordination costs. The trade-off is that the setup costs correspondingly increase, thus a balance has to be mat met between the small batch size and the limits of work in progress. In her book, Making Work Visible, Dr. DeGrandis points out, in knowledge, however, in knowledge work, however, problems with coordination costs grow nonlinearly with batch size. Old school management assumptions about economies of scale do not apply to knowledge work problems such as software development. The trap is to optimize locally, i.e. maximize the output of a particular department rather than the business-wide. So this is a fail early, fail quickly, test and measure kind of approach. So another thing is time boxing as opposed to scope boxing. So in the practice of fixing the time available for a project and adjusting the scope of work to fit, this provides a focus on delivering finished useful work. The time boxing helps prevent simulation death spirals where an analyst wants to keep going deeper down a rabbit hole. The real breakthrough comes when small batch size and time boxing are used together and motivated use all of these techniques regularly to maximize the investment of our clients. So trade-off curves. An example, on a project where we led the analysis of hundreds of components, we analyzed the components against accelerations in X, Y, and Z directions, and then just reported the safety factors as the first cut. Uh, then we analyzed the components using uh, the component fasteners using simple and conservative methods. So then we published all that data so everybody had a, a really clear view of what was working and what wasn't working. And then for the brackets that failed, uh, we went through round two and redesigned or evaluated using advanced methods on those brackets. So the effect of this approach can't be overstated. The basic calculations provided the designers immediate feedback on whether the designs were on the page and whether insights into simple modifications could make or improve the strength of their part. The full list of components with associated safety factors was continually being updated and provided, as a, good, provided a good source of data for the design improvement priorities. Finally, the list was sorted and colored by increasing safety factor and provided a visual dashboard for management to easily understand simulation progress at a glance. So another key learning um, is validated learnings. So according to Eric, Rees, two of the most important questions for leaders to ask is, what do we know and how do we know it? So Rees expounds on the scientific process to answer the above questions and calls the results validated learnings. For example, an important hypothesis might be that if we do X, it'll lead to Y. A quick minimum viable product or minimum viable simulation would then be used to test that hypothesis and the results documented using actual data to assist with decision making and making the data available has some real benefits. Primarily, it gets everyone aligned on what, on what reality is and what's true and prevents expensive loop, loopbacks from incorrect assumption and allows developers to show true progress. In fact, in tech startups, it can be used as a justification for further investment. The key is to make the validated learnings visible. A3s, checklists, trade-off curves, are great ways to convey existing knowledge correctly. I like how Deming said it, in God we trust, all others must bring data. Psychological safety. Perhaps surprisingly, we believe 
that psychological safety is the most critical element to effective simulation-driven uh, product development. Why is this so important? If you want your people to move fast and break things, it has to be safe for them to fail, both for them personally and for the organization. In fact, in a now famous Google study of 180 teams, psychological safety was found to be the most important factor in seeking answers to the question, what makes an effective team at Google? This is particularly important for analysts. Recall some of the stereotypical analyst traits. We're detail-oriented. We want to be sure. We don't like to be wrong, and we can be over-conservative. We may have a rigid view on the appropriate or quality scope of work. So it's not enough to reassure an analyst like me that you just want a back-of-the-envelope calculation. I'm process-driven, and I need specifics. So the risk I'm worried about, consciously or not, is that the results will be misinterpreted and someone will get hurt or the design will fail. So how do we allay these fears? Here are some practical tips. Allow for just subjective and objective measures to be published together. Allow for the designers to undertake quick analyses for optimization and comparison. And then grade these results, i.g. give them a safety factor and a level of confidence. So the safety factor is the uh, um, analytical result. The, Confidence is the guy's gut feel, is how, how well he thinks he did his job. So that gives us a, a, and then we can use those two factors to give us a red, yellow, or green traffic light system, which managers can use to effectively feel if their analysts have really got um, the safety they need, actually to get a feel for whether they actually got the result they want and the, with the analyst having the psychological safety he needs. So a Kiwi, uh, this Kiwi Rail, um, I don't show the carriages here, but back in 2009, I believe, Kiwi Rail started a process of developing new carriages for the Trans-Scenic and the Trans-Alpine um, routes. And they were very uh, strategic to New Zealand, so basically very focused on um, tourism, which is a big driver for Motivated, or for New Zealand. So Motivated was engaged to do the bogies for those Trans-Scenic and Trans-Alpine carriages. And our task was to replicate much more cheaply and on narrow gauge rail the ride quality that people would expect from Europe or in Asia. And we don't have that in New Zealand, just to be clear. We got rough rail, we got rough carriages, we got rough bogies, and we needed to step up. So, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, a lot of people have heard me talk about this because it really is a pet uh, project of mine. Mo uh, New Zealand did an amazing job developing those carriages, and those carriages uh, were um, noted in, um, in the press for being quiet, smooth, really pleasant to ride on, really smart, like a lot of knowledge, and Motivated takes a lot of credit for that. And we did some very, very innovative things in rail. We pushed rail industry hard to allow us to use things like isomeric dampers, which have their own damping as well as their springs, and also quiet the noise in places where they wouldn't normally be used in rail. So one of the things that Motivated did that brought real rigor and power to that, um, that whole development of those carriages was our designers were our analysts. And the rapid evolution and multiple analysis rounds that went we went through were providing ever-increasing levels of detail. Uh, the methods have been, been proven to be incredibly powerful, uh, even in highly regulated industries like aerospace and rail. You know, I'm really interested in continuing these tests and develop ideas further and creating something like an Agile Manifesto. Come and have a chat with me about it later because it's really important to me that we get the message across that there's a lot more to analysis than analysts realize. What Motivated is creating is unique in the world. It's not just unique in New Zealand. And I really want to help manufacturers get to market quicker, reduce the cost to get there, and to make sure that their product is exactly what the users wanted. And that's Motivated's commitment to our, to our clients. So. This is a really big part of it. What Daniel and Carlos are doing in the product development is a really big part of it. So I really encourage you to come talk to us, see what we can provide you. We are committed to you guys making a big difference in the world. For me as an import, I love New Zealand. It's like Alaska without winter, where I grew up. And for me, you know, I just think that we need to punch big on the world stage. There's no place for us to play small. We have an innovative culture. We have really creative people. We have some of the best engineers in the world coming out of Canada Uni and ARA. I feel so privileged to be part of the Canterbury development, you know. 
New Zealand in general punches well above its weight. And the only way we're going to do that is to do things differently, to have some real ability to try things newly, to learn quickly, to fail fast, get to market with robust products that make a big difference on the world stage. We won't make it selling to each other. We'll only make it selling to the world. I'm committed that Motivated helps New Zealand sell to the world. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, Greg, you mentioned how you want the analysts to be the designers and vice versa. Uh, do you want this mentality to come from the uh, educational side of these analysts, or do you want these to be injected by the managers and the trainers? Uh, how do you expect this to happen to existing your designers and your analysts? I, that's a great question. Um, what Motivated does, I think, is going to be unique. So having our designers be analysts is kind of a unique thing in Motivated. I don't think you can really, without an analysis mentor in your organization, have your designers being analysts. So I'm not saying that everybody wants to do that. You want your designers to do analysis, but they don't want to be analysts. Does that make sense? So they want to use SolidWorks simulation, Solid Edge simulation, uh, Nastran NCAD uh, with Inventor. They want to use those tools, and I'll help them learn how to use those effectively, have some templates, have some checklists that they can use to use uh, you know, linear static analysis as a very effective design tool. But I don't call them analysts. They're doing analysis in the design environment. What Motivated does is we train everybody like I was trained at Boeing. Everyone in Motivated gets trained to be an analyst, and then they can use all the analysis tools. They can do creep analysis. They can do nonlinear or you know, impact analysis. But it takes a lot of learning about the math and physics. There takes a real rigor. Motivated, you know, I'm unabashed of the fact that it costs a bit more to come to Motivated to get your job done. And part of the reason for that is we do so much training. It's really important to me that the guys that I got in my team know everything I know and everything that they know, and then they expose that to me and I learn from them. Our culture is completely built around learning. That's what we're there for. The knowledge that we expose to our clients allows them to learn about their products and from our knowledge that's already pre-existing. So you already know your products and I can't teach you that. Like I don't even know that. I come into a client, I have to learn from them. What is it you do? How do you do it? Why do you do it? But I'll bring to that party an intense knowledge of math and physics, an intense realization of what we can simulate in the real world, you know, what we can then validate through test. Motivated our experts at that and so I'm not saying that everyone should have analysts on their team. I don't think they should. Motiv New Zealand is too small for everyone to have analysts. Fisher and Paykel should have analysts. Um, you know, Tate should have analysts. Uh, Enphase should have analysts. But most firms are, you know, 50 people. They're not going to have analysts. They will have great designers, however. Everybody that comes out of Canada Uni or Aura probably has a hands-on background. They already understand math machines at a fundamental level. They're going to take the math and physics that they do know, apply that in their designs in a really great way with a little bit of help with SOLIDWORKS simulation and, you know, uh, solid edge simulation. Does that make sense? Is that, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome.